Okay, so let's we can make the essay deadline. Um, let's let's just move it to Thursday. So uh, Thursday night going into Friday, you can turn the essay in. You know, considering people are without power and all all this stuff, I figure there's bigger things to worry about. I've got a pile of essays I have to grade before I get to these anyway. So uh, unless one of you objects, we can move it back a couple of days. Okay, so. So I'm guessing maybe some of you might've started working on it. If you have, feel free to uh, send me an early copy. I can take a quick look at it. Maybe offer you some suggestions or something to that effect. So feel free to take me up on that if you so choose. So um, yeah, other than that, we're moving quickly towards the midterm. Um, I think next, just taking a quick look at the calendar, it looks like that will be next Wednesday. Okay, next Wednesday. So we're quickly moving towards it. Um, Are we going to do a review for that? Yeah, the, we will do the review for that next Monday. Yeah, next Monday, we will do the review. Um, the last reading we're going to do before before the midterm is this Wednesday. We're going to start our unit on drama that day. So on Wednesday, we're going to start, we're going to read two short plays. One's called the York Play of the Crucifixion. The other one's Mankind. So we're going to take one quick dive back into medieval literature on Wednesday by covering some medieval drama. So um, the, the page numbers for that are on the syllabus. So 521 to 28, 587 to 612. But yes, next Monday we will do the review for, uh, for the midterm. I've educated myself on how this is going to work Basically, you're going to take this thing on Blackboard the day of the exam. Um, the way that it's going to work, though, um, we will get on Zoom that that day. So you're going to you're going to have your you're going to have to. I'm going to show you how to do this next Monday during a review. But you're going to have to download this thing called the Lockdown Browser. That makes sure that you can't open up any other tabs besides Blackboard on the day of the exam. And uh, we will get on Zoom that day too. And like, I will just, I'll pull the gallery view up. And then like, I'll proctor it from, from there. You know, just to, just to make sure you're not, uh, I don't, I trust everybody in here, right? This is a, this is an honor code kind of class but I'll, I'll proctor the exam just to make sure you're not getting up and going every one to different rooms or your eyes aren't going 50 different places right I'll, I'll look out for all those sort of warning signs but I trust that none of you will do that but uh, you will need to turn your camera on that day uh, black screens aren't going to cut it that day so um but everything will go smoothly. There, there will be a part of the exam that I will ask you to do before the exam starts. Um, that part will be a short essay. I figure there's no point in having you do, uh, normally in normal times, there's three parts to my exam. There's multiple choice, there's short answer, and there's a short essay. Normally you just go in with a blue book, pen and paper and write out your exam. Well, uh, it's kind of hard to do the short essay on Blackboard. So I, can, I will let you do that part um, before the, the test starts. 
So um, I will give you that next Monday as well. You can write out that part before the test starts and submit it before the test starts. And then you can do the other, the other part of the day of the exam. But that probably won't take you too long that day. I'd say it'll take you 30, 35, 40 minutes to do the rest of it. Maybe even less if you really kept up with the material and concepts and all that good stuff. Will the test just be at two o'clock like a normal class time would? Yeah, it'll be at two o'clock next Wednesday. Yeah, so it'll be just like normal. We get on here and you <coughs> meet on Zoom, but you'll open up your lockdown browser and take the test. Is it going to be open or closed notes? Um, it will be closed notes, no notes. Now, if I let you, if I had you do the essay the day of the exam, I would uh, let you have an outline. But since, but since you're doing the essay before the exam, there's no need for that even. So, uh, yeah, no notes. It'll be completely. All the stuff's going to be on history and course concepts and passage identifications and things like that. So, uh, yeah, there won't be any need for, for notes. Not that I think that any of you will need them anyway. Like I said, I think all of you will ace this thing. The way my exams work, they're easy for people who've done the reading. If you haven't done the reading, they're a nightmare. Okay, normally I have lots of A's and B's and lots of F's. It's usually pretty uh, clear um, based on who's done the reading over the semester and who's not. Um, so, but I, I haven't written the test yet. I've taught this class before. I'm going to look up my old test, see what I can salvage from it. Um, but Next month, but by next Monday, I will have written the test. And then I can give you a good review after the plus. You'll have the it won't just be during class, you'll have the recording of the review that you can use all the way up until the exam starts. So that's a, a added perk that we you wouldn't have gotten in a previous semester. So that'll all be good, well, and good too. Other questions about anything of that nature? So there will be two things due next week. Um, you'll have, we'll have the exam and then right before we end for spring break, you're gonna turn your poem in too. We're gonna to talk, we're gonna talk about the Shakespeare poem form today. And on Wednesday, I will officially introduce the assignment where you write your own poem. So we'll review on Wednesday. We'll talk about Shakespeare's sonnets. We'll talk about Wyatt and Petrarch's sonnets. We'll talk about the Sir Gowan alliterative form. So we'll review all that on Wednesday. So over the next week plus, um, you'll be working on your poem as well. Okay, so. Uh, when is spring break? Yeah, spring break is the week of March 15th to 19th. So we, next week is our last week before spring break starts. Thank you. Well, then when we come back from spring break on um, the 22nd of March, we're going to dive really heavy into um, renaissance drama after that so we'll read a couple of shakespeare plays uh, dr faustus the really good part of this class starts after spring break my favorite part of the class the drama the drama part uh, this that's definitely my favorite part of teaching this class hopefully i will give you guys a new found appreciation of Shakespeare, that's my, that's my hope. <coughs> okay. 
So, uh, yeah, we're moving along. So, in place of not doing much reading over the next week plus, that's what you'll do. You'll be preparing for your test as well as doing your poem. Any other questions, comments, concerns before we get started talking about Shakespeare's sonnets? All right, so let's go ahead and get started talking about these then. Um, so this form that we're covering today is the English sonnet, the English sonnet as popularized by Shakespeare. So like, I, like we talked about the other day, Sir Thomas Wyatt's sonnets were almost a direct imitation of um, Petrarch's. Right, we even kind of compared what the two looked like. Petrarch's version of like who so list to hunt versus Wyatt's version of who so list to hunt. Right? We talked about how maybe Wyatt's version had a little extra added edge considering uh, he worked for Henry VIII. But uh, Petrarch's rhyme and meter and all that's a lot harder than uh, Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's is actually pretty easy. So let's let's kind of go over the schematics here. Let me, um, pull pull up my prompt really quick. Or actually, I'll just pull up blank page of notes. Just a second. One thing that we're going to talk about today that we did not talk about last Wednesday is meter. We need to talk about meter, uh, the rhythm of the lines. It's something that we didn't talk about last time. And I want to cover that pretty extensively today. Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, Microsoft Word, you're wrong. That's how you spell Shakespeare and shut up. Maybe I'm. No, maybe I'm wrong. Well, darn. Okay, so the way that, so here's how the Shakespearean sonnet rhymes. Okay, we talked about how in the Petrarch sonnet, they write, it rhymes A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, E, E. Well, the Shakespeare sonnet's much easier. It rhymes A, B, A, B. C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, G. So in a Shakespeare sonnet, every other line rhymes, basically, except the last two lines. And you have your A, E sound, your first and third line, your B sound, and your second and fourth line, your C sound, and your fifth and seventh lines, D in your sixth and eighth, your E sound in your uh, ninth and eleventh, your F sound in your tenth and twelfth, and then you have your final rhyming couplet in the thirteenth and fourteenth lines. So again, this is a fourteen-line poem. We'll, um, this in your books turn to 1204 or 1204 every time i see shakespeare sonnets i mostly go over the same two the same two sonnets if you guys noticed any that you want to talk about besides those two that i normally like to talk about today feel free to speak up we can talk about it, the meaning and all that just to see how this rhyme works turn to 1204 1204 
So the poem I always like to teach is number 18. Number 18. You guys might have actually heard this one before. Um, this is one of the this is one of the most commonly taught of Shakespeare's sonnets. But um, zoom out a little bit here. So just before we dive into the content of the sonnet, just look at the final rhymes at the end of the lines. So we have just to start out our A sounds. So day and may. We have our B sound, temperate and uh, date. Temper, I guess the way you would pronounce temperate, temperate in the line would be temperate. We have shines and declines as our C sound. Dim and untrimmed as our D sound. Fade and shade as our E sound. Oest and growest as our F sound. And then our final rhyming lines, which is our G sound, is C and V. And basically, every other every other line has a different sound. Besides, pretty much, right? That's that's pretty much how this works. Um, so a little bit easier to wrap your mind around than the other sonnet form because every other line rhymes. You can't. The only thing you hear is you can't repeat the same sound. So let's say you want your day and May sound to be your A line. Well, it couldn't have bay and say later in the poem right because that would that would be repeating the a sound again so they all i will letter them as letters here in teaching what they look like but you can't repeat the same sound right whatever your a sound is is your a sound whatever your d sound is is your d sound so am i, am I making sense here about rhyme Yes. Okay. Very, very good. Very good. So whenever you write your own, if you do this form, just make sure that you don't repeat the same sound a couple of times through the poem. You have to mix it up. Um, besides that, <clears throat> one of the, we need to talk about meter in, in a poem. And, especially a sonnet. So meter is the rhythm that the poem goes in. This is where stuff gets, you guys might might get confused on this part. This is where this, is where this stuff gets started it starts getting more confusing as meter. You kind of have to have an ear for it. Um, in teaching it, I'm going to give you my best William Shatner impersonation. Okay, I'm going to heavily enunciate all these syllables so that you can kind of hear how it works. Um, so, basic, so basically English poetry is written in a form called iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. As I'll show you in a second, an iamb is a type of foot within the line. Pentameter means there's five feet in the line. So you might ask yourself, what's a foot? What, what the hell is he talking about? What's a foot? So this, this depends on what syllables are stressed in a line. That's what a foot is. So an I am, so this is how the syllables work. An I am, you have an unstressed syllable. That's what the little dash symbol means here. Then a stressed syllable. And that's what the little line here signifies. So this kind of takes a, the dumb, the dumb, the dumb. It kind of takes that beat, a sort of, I don't know if you guys can hear me pounding my fist against the table, right? But 
it kind of takes that light it takes a little bit of a light beat then a heavy beat right a the dumb the dumb so that's what an i am is and in a perfect and in a perfect line of iambic pentameter poetry you would have your syllables do this five times so you would have, this is called one of these alone is called a foot so you have five feet in the line hence the pentameter so here's one foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet. So that this in a way would be a perfect line of iambic pentameter poetry. It takes that beat. Now there's other way, there's other types of feet that you can have in a line as well. Okay, so whenever you, whenever you write your own, you kind of have to keep track of where your syllables are. You do, it's okay to have one or two other feet besides an I am in a line, but you want to make sure the majority of your feet in the line are I am's. Otherwise, it's no longer I am the pentameter. So some of the other types of uh, feet that you can have in poetry is one's called a trochee. And that's the opposite of an iamb. So this is where you have a foot that has a stress syllable then an unstressed syllable. So one of the famous poems, we're not going to read this poem in this class. One of the famous poems from one of the great romantic poets, William Blake, just to see how this works when we write it out. His, his, you know, opening lines to his poem, The Tiger. It's tiger, tiger, burning bright. Well, so tiger is two sil is a two-syllable word, right? He's you might say, why why did you spell tiger this way? That's not a that's not a mistake. That's how he spells it in the poem. Tag er, tag er. Right, so we can kind of see which syllable in the line is stressed, and which isn't. Tag, er, tag, er. Then burn, ing. The burn is your stressed syllable, and bright is only one syllable. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. So that's what a tro that's what a trochaic line sounds like. The word you, it starts out with the first letter is stressed, the second syllable isn't stressed. <coughs> you have uh, another foot called an anapest. Anapest. This is a three-syllable foot. So typically, if you have an anapest, you maybe want to avoid um, having more than one of these in a line. But an anapest is a two, two unstresses followed by a stress. So normally what anapest, anapest take the form of is usually like a prepositional phrase in a line of poetry. And let's say maybe something like in the night. Each one of those words is three, is only one syllable long. Like when we say it in the night, the in is a preposition, so that's not stressed. The is an article, so that's not stressed. But night is a noun, so that would be stressed. In the night. 
I think the second line of Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, it, yeah, is actually in the darkness of the night. So this is a good, this is a good illustrate. This second line is a good illustrator of what I, of what Anapes looked like in the darkness of the night. Well, the second part of this wouldn't be an anapest. I mean, let me do this over here in the dark. Nice. Of the night. So two unstressed syllables followed by stress syllable. Usually like in a prepositional phrase, in the night. By the by, the dawn, right? Usually, the poet. If you read through a lot of poetry, the one the poet who uses the, these the most is uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Edgar Allan Poe uses a lot of these um, anapests in his poetry. If you, we can, if we scan through the poem like Annabelle Lee, um, he uses a lot of these. And then another, the final type of foot is called a dactyl. A dactyl. Let me uh, look at my notes really quick just to make sure I'm not giving you the wrong information on a dactyl. Um, Yeah, okay, I'm right. A dactyl is a stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. So that's what a dactyl is. You don't see a lot of dactyls in poetry, but they sometimes they sometimes show up. Um let me get you an example. Okay. Picture yourself. A boat on a river. This is the Beatles song, right? Picture yourself on a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies, right? Mr. Tambourine Man. But so, pictures, two syllables, right? Picture yourself. So this first part of this is the, is a dactyl pick. So we have our stress here, our unstress, and our unstress. And that that foot is a dactyl. Like I said, these don't show up as much as the other three, um, but they do sometimes show up. But so long as most of your lines, most of your feet, you have to have five feet in the line. Normally, the five feet come to ten syllables. Okay, you have to, so every if you write your own poems, you have ten syllables in a line, and most of them are iams. Take the the thumb, the thumb, the thumb beat. So let me show you, let me uh, show you let me map out how this works in a in sonnet eighteen. And then you can guys can give me some questions from there if this is kind of confusing. A sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day?
Now are more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds to shake the darling buds of May. So that, let's uh, scan these first three lines. So let's let's take, talk about how the syllables work. So you might ask yourself, okay, what 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 line is what syllable stressed and what's not? Lots of times that's just an ear test. Right? You kind of have to just say it. And ask yourself, okay, what syllable does the tongue put more stress on? If you look a word up in the dictionary, if you look a word up in the dictionary, it'll tell you what syllable in the word is stressed and what isn't. So, like, um, I, don't know, I might as well just go ahead and sh show you how this works if you want to do this yourself later. We are on dictionary.com. Let's just look up compare. So yeah, anytime you look a word up in the dictionary, it'll tell you how the syllables work. So compare. The pair is bolded. Right. So that says that shows you that it's a two-syllable word. The pair part is the one that your tongue puts more stress on. Compare, compare. So going back to this. So here's here's a couple of basic rules. One syllable nouns are always stressed. So a word like night or day, um, those are always stressed. Prepositions, and articles are usually not stressed. So I've mentioned above in an anapest, lots of times you have the prepositional phrase. Prepositions and articles are typically not stressed. So a, an, and the, um, then your preposition words, right? From, um, where, my old eighth grade English teacher used to say, where can a cat go, right? To, to the, uh, to the bed, right? To the milk bowl. So preposition words are not stressed. One syllable nouns are always stressed. And sometimes um, in a multiple syllable word, you just kind of have to kind of hear it out to see which syllable stressed and which isn't. Or look it up in the dictionary if you're confused. Um, I saw a question pop up up above. I'm trying, I'm trying to access it here. Um, let me see what the question was. Um, Kara, you sent me a private message. Yes, I can stay after. So that, to scan the first line of this, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So if I'm, if I'm scanning this line, shall I, compare the, so we have two perfect IMs to start the line, but then we have a trochee in the middle of the line. The two
And we have another I am a sum. I'm gonna do this on Word. It's not this is the time where a chalkboard would be helpful. Summer's day. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So we have two IMs to start, a trophy in the middle, and two IMs to close it out. So four iambic feet in this line, and one trophy. Thou art more lovely and more Per but rough oops let me grief word rough winds. Do shake the dar wing buds of May. The third line is completely perfect. It's a perfect iambic line. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. That's a perfect line. <clears throat> so that's how meter works in this in these things. So if you when you write your own, like I said, I'm not looking for a perfect iambic line all the time. You just gotta make sure most of your most of the rhythm in your line has that the thumb, the thumb, the thumb. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is a this is a really hard ass thing to teach. Okay, so I want to check in to make sure that I'm making sense here. So what what am I what am I not explaining? Will ask ask me questions now. You guys, you guys hear what I'm saying? Do you hear the rhythm and what and when I, when I, and what the way that I was doing that? I do. Okay. You do good. Good, good. Kelsey. Yeah, it to you. Will it be more difficult if, like, ah. our word choices for our poems are have like more syllables, or if they're uh, a little bit more complex? <clears throat> yeah, if you have three or four syllable words, you kind of have to keep up with with the syllables, right? So, getting it, get it. If you do have big words in your lines, you want to make sure you maybe keep them to a minimum right because that it becomes a lot harder to keep up with at that point um so yeah if you have a three or four syllable word the best advice i would give you would be to look it up in the dictionary to see which word is stress to see which syllables are stressed and which aren't that's my best advice um But yet, but you have to meet the ten feet, the five, the five feet in the line, the ten syllables, five feet. So the more big words you put in, the harder it is to squeeze all a lot of meaning into one line. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. 
it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Like writing, I think you know, what you guys will find once you write these things, um, you'll appreciate the artistry that went behind them a lot more. Because it is hard to get everything you want in there. Right, and get the perfect word. Right, sometimes, sometimes you might write a line two or three times until you get it right. Um, but um, that's the struggle. Then, no matter which, if you do a Shakespeare or a Petrarchan, you need to write it in I am Tanner. So, um, Petrarchan's just got a slightly harder rhyme scheme to match. If you do a Petrarchan and you pull it off, I'll be very impressed. Then, of course, if you do the Sir Gowan alliterative poem, you write a longer poem, but you don't have to worry about the meter and all this so much. All right? If you do a Sir Gowan poem, you're just going to make sure that you repeat the same consonant sound in the line three or four times. So that's the easiest one, even though it's longer. So if we do like the Sir Gowan one, will it be a little bit more about the content rather than just the execution? There's still execution, right? You got to make sure you repeat the consonant sounds. You got to have your bob and wheel at the end. But um, that that's basically what I'm going to be grading you guys on when I do this. I don't care what your poems are about. Right? It could be the corniest thing I've ever read in my life. Right? Well, if, but if you um, if you execute it well, you're going to get an A. Right? That's that's basically the purpose of, of this. It's not a creative writing class exercise so much as it is an exercise showing, hey, you understand sort of the schematics of a sonnet and you can write you can produce your own it, it can it can suck right but as long as it meets the form that's all i'm looking for okay yeah so um yeah that basic but that's basically it, it meets the form great But if it's if it's a fun poem, you know, content-wise, all the better, all the better, right? So let's um, let's spend a couple of minutes. Let's spend a few minutes then talking about some of these uh, Shakespeare sonnets. I've covered I've covered the form. Let's just talk about the content now of some of these. Okay, I, I always like to compare eighteen and one thirty. These are the my two favorite ones to to compare. So while we're on the page, let's let me just read uh, sonnet eighteen to you really quick. So this this poem this poem takes the conventional Petrarchan sort of sort of theme, right? The sort this is a very romantic type of poem. Right, so shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often as his gold complexion dims, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wondrous in his shade, when in internal lines the time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So, um, Again, just before I talk about the content, again, notice that the first eight lines of the poem set up the idea, and the final six lines of the poem give resolution to the idea. Shakespeare often does this. He, he oftentimes starts his ninth line out with the word but. So 
this is his showing that the resolution of the poem's coming. So one of you guys explain, one of you guys break this down. What's this poem mean? What's the idea that this poem's trying to invoke? Any any thoughts here? This guy's giving a, a gal some compliments, right? I'll give you a second to read over it again so one of you can tell me what you think. All right, so I'll go Socratic on you then, okay, since, since you guys are shy today. Um, so summer, a summer's day, right? Summer's day, very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, summer, summertime is short, though. Summertime is short. So, um, well. I, I felt. Okay, go ahead, Nicole. I felt that it was kind of like Tom really has no effect on his love for whoever this is about. And even though that like appearances change, uh, our spirits stay the same. And that when you really love somebody, that's what it's about. It's not all about appearance. Cause it says, but thy eternal summer shall never fade nor lose passion of that fair thou owest. Right, you're you're exactly right. That's that's kind of what he's saying here. Right, he he's being a little clever here, too. Right, he's saying he's saying, okay, time will age you. You'll be a wrinkled old leaves, or you know, in thirty years or whatever. Or it's even kind of a wink, wink. Right, this poem's so damn good. We'll be reading it five hundred years later. Right, because he say he's he's saying, so long as this poem is on paper, so long as so long the final two lines, so long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this and give this gives life to thee. So he's he's saying here as long as this po as long as people will picture her beauty with this poem. Her beauty will never fade. Her beauty will never die. It will always be, she will always be like a summer's day. Right? Pretty, pretty cool, right? I've always, I've always loved, I always have loved this, this poem. Pretty smooth. Do you think he was a little bit overconfident in assuming that this work would be received so well and would last so long? Or do you think he just had it right on the line? That's that's hard to say. That's really hard to say. Um, I mean, I don't think I don't think he had any inclination that he would be the writer, right, for hundreds of years after. Right? Anytime we talk about English literature, Shakespeare is the guy, right? That he's. I don't know if he would have had any conception that he would be so lauded centuries after his death some people think shakespeare never existed right some people think that this was a rich guy um, and that, a lot of scholars think this a lot of scholars think that no middle class guy could have written stuff like this i mean i've, I've always thought that's a little elitist and snobbish um, some people think the guy never even existed that it was a guy writing under a that it was a rich guy writing under a pseudonym. So, have they ever found out where William Shakespeare was actually buried? Because I know when I was in Europe in 2018, they talked about how you know he had a grave site in a church, like we were going by it, but his remains weren't actually there; they had been moved. That's a good question. 
I don't, I don't know right off. Where is Shakespeare buried? Yeah, he's buried at the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford upon Avon. That's where he's from originally, is Stratford. Um, so you can go to his house there now. And he's, his corpse is supposedly buried in that church. We visited the cottage and it was beautiful. It was absolutely amazing. Did they tell you the fact about this, this about how he left his wife his second best? Yes, they dad? did. <laughs> you want to explain to the class why he left his wife the second best bed? Do you remember? It's been quite a while. You would probably do it better justice than me. Yeah, it's, it's a fun little fact. Uh, on his death, Shakespeare off gave his wife, and the only thing he gave her in the will was the second best bed in his house. And I asked herself, that's kind of a dick move, right? Why give her the second best bed? Well, because the second best bed was the bed that was used in the master bedroom, right? You saved your best bed to your guests. Okay, so that... That's why he gave her his second best bed and his wheel. Right? Americans don't work that way, right? We we have our best bed in our bedroom, right? But they the Brit the Brits they love to they put the best bed in their get in the bedroom. So just a fun little fact trivia fact there for you. I can't remember exactly, but I know in high school we read one of his sonnets that was like sp supposedly really controversial, and it was about some kind of love interest. But he was describing a black woman. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Okay, so th those sonnets are called the Dark Lady sonnets, and uh, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily put race on the, the character in the dark lady sonnets. Um, she's compare compared to sonnet 18 here, we might, you know, where you kind of imagine you're like a blonde, right? Sort of sort of woman that he might be describing. The dark lady sonnets are are different, right? They're, it's a different, it's more of a brunette maybe a little bit darker skin. Um, but the subject of those poems, the dark part is more thematic. Right, am I, am I making sense here? So um, it's not necessarily- Yeah, you're making sense. Yeah, it's not necessarily, it's about her soul, her soul and all this stuff, right? More than, more than her skin color necessarily. We're, I'm actually getting ready to cover a dark lady sonnet. So let's look at 130 now. 130. And that is on page um, 1213. 1213. So uh, Kelsey, Kelsey had to go. I don't know if she had a disconnect or whatever. But you... The three ladies that are still with me here after I read this poem, tell me if you would be wooed by the content of this poem if your significant other gave this to you, okay? My mistress's eyes are no... So this is a great comparison with 18. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And I in some perfumes is there more delight, and in some perfumes is there more delight. Than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go, 
My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare as any she belied with false compare. So, uh, the first eight or nine lines, right? He's talking about, well, damn, she's she's not the the prettiest lady around, right? Yeah. She's nothing like the sun. She, her there's no complexion in her there's no rose colored complexion in her cheeks. Her hair is like wire. Her breath smells, right? But yeah. us being in the perspective as the mistress, <laughs> that would be a little bit offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, a, what about the ending, right? Despite all of her perfect imperfections, it goes to show that he loves her, right? Compare that to he loves her more, right? He acknowledges her imperfections. So I he, would be flattered in a way. Uh, honestly, like I would be flattered, but I would also be very offended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it because of the honesty with it, because people aren't perfect and you don't have to be perfect physically to be loved by someone. I really enjoyed this one. I wouldn't be happy to get this at all. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd be offended, not very happy. Maybe a divorce coming his way. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm. I think I'm with Nicole here. I, I enjoy the content. Um, you know, the, he's kind of calling out the patriarchal sonnet here in this poem. Right, he's saying that. You know, all this, all this wild, exaggerated stuff about love, right? And how she's the best thing since sliced bread, right? I mean, lo real love doesn't work that way, right? Real love is, is more than skin deep, right? So. And I feel like this one just requires you to be honest with yourself and, uh, just whenever you're confronting this piece because it's so true like I've cared about people who weren't the prettiest people in the world and I'm certain that I'm not the prettiest person to everyone that sees me but I know I've been loved really strongly by people who might not find me the most beautiful thing in the world right you know, it's more of a love of the soul here right more than more than physical appearance which is which is which is a nice idea, right? But yeah, I, I always enjoy comparing these two poems because it's I think eighteen and one thirty are even talking to one another in a way based on their the themes. I feel like eighteen is the young man who is new to adulthood, and one thirty is the mature gentleman that knows a bit more about the world. Right. Yeah, it is. there's 180 of these in total. And they all kind of like build off of each other. Um, so if, you ever, if you're ever curious just to read through them, um, I would encourage it. I haven't ever read through all 180 of them myself. That's something I'd like to do. Do you guys know the actor Patrick Stewart? He plays, he plays, he's Captain Picard in Star Trek and plays Professor X and X-Men, right? You guys know Patrick Stewart. He's, he's had a thing on YouTube over the past year where he reads one aloud every day. I think he's actually going in the order and like he'll read it and then he'll explain like what he thinks it means and all this stuff. I would encourage you to look that up on YouTube. All right, even just like watch one of them a day. It's actually pretty uh pretty good content. So those are the ones I I plan to talk about. Is there any other ones you guys might have read that you want to 
might want to draw the class's attention to before we depart. Okay, so the main, the main thing then is to know the form. Right, you want to know the form. So know those rhymes, know, those, know that meter. Okay, if you do, if you, if you guys feel confident that you have that down, um, you will do well when you write your own, I'm sure. As you guys see too, these poems aren't as hard as what a lot of pe people might think they are, or, uh, people make them out to be. Right? You think of Shakespeare, you think, oh, this guy's so, so hard. He's so stuffy, right? He has nothing to do with, nothing in common with me, right? Not, not the case. Right? I think it's just a bad teaching way. What makes people think that way? Um, I don't think he's boring. At least a lot of people do. I don't think so. Of course, we're going to read two of his plays soon too. So you'll you'll get to you get that a couple some of his plays in addition to his poems. All right, so good, good. Remember Wednesday, we're reading a couple of those short plays, York play, A Crucifixion, and, and uh, Every Man. Um, so we'll see you guys then. All right, Kara, what questions you got for me? Okay, next week our test is Wednesday at 2, right? That's right, yeah. Um. Would you be willing to, or if you're allowed to, care to give that to me earlier in the morning, maybe, or the day after or before? I sit with a lady that does, and I'm just worried that if she tries to get up or something and you're wanting to watch us, that I'll have to get up with her so she don't fall. Is that something you'd be willing to do or no? Um, I mean, you can take it. If you want to just take it to normal time, I will know that you're, I mean, I will know that you're helping someone out. So if you do have to get up for something, you can just private message me if you want. I don't Okay, because I didn't know if there was like a time limit on it because I know some of the tests are timed on there. And I was worried if, you know, she did get up and I had to get up with her that I wouldn't be able to answer other questions or anything. No, I don't have anything to do. So, I mean, if you take a little longer than the rest of the class that's fine okay i just want to make sure with you before i let her know anything yeah so yeah that's that's cool um like i said that day of you can just message me if you have to get up or something that's that's fine okay i, I, tr I appreciate I trust, it i trust you so okay so. she won't let me treat either <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so that won't, won't be a problem at all. Okay, thank you so much. Well.